Like the kind of bull that they serve around here. Made a way back in top of them hills where they plenty of them got Hey, welcome back to Barley and Hobbs. I'm George. You know, the most fun we have, and we say this all the time, is the time we get to spend with you. So, welcome back for another edition of our video series. Now listen, this one's going to be a two-part video, so we hope you stick with us through the whole thing. Because we're going to cover a lot of information, but we're going to take it step by step so we can put it all together. And uh, I think, my, my intent is, is that you really pick up a lot of great information and that you can apply this in a lot of other different areas throughout your life. Um, we're going to show you the difference between the uh, something you're familiar with is a Mighty Mini. It's a combination pot reflux still, and we have the traditional eight-gallon pot still. Uh, we're going to also cover heating options. We're going to cover procedures for heating, and then we're also going to delve into a couple of other things. With, you know, with heater elements, how to test them, how to make sure that they're working, how to select the right one, how to wire them up. Um, and all those things that are, are necessary. So, without further ado, let me set these aside because we're even going to use some old instruments that you may find lying around, a multimeter, um, and I've got a digital and I've got the analog, so either one will work. I just want you to be aware of that. Uh, you've probably got these out in the garage somewhere. And most folks know what they are. A lot of folks just look at them and they're just befuddled by them, but we're going to clear that up. We've got a lot going on. Um, look. You, everybody's familiar with the Mighty Mini, and the Mighty Mini is a combination pot reflux still. Now, of course, it comes with the hoses, it comes with everything you need. And you'll notice the difference right away if you see a combination pot reflux as opposed to a standard, just a straight pot still with a column. A pot still with a column will not have this jacket, or there's another technique, which is the cross tubes. Now, there's some discussion on whether the cross tubes are more efficient than the jacket. It all depends on your personality. And remember, there's, there are a thousand ways of doing this. They're all right as long as it satisfies your need. So if doing something a particular way is successful, there's no need to change that just because someone offered that to you, uh, unless you want to try it. And if that new way seems to be more efficient, and work better than the way you were doing it, well then there's no, there's no problem with changing. But don't change to something just because someone said so. Hey, and another interesting fact too is that if somebody tells you something, check. There's nothing wrong with checking, uh, but look up their information to make sure that uh, their information is credible. All right, now for a combination pot reflux steel, you'll have this jacket. And what that is, is it's a pre-condensing chamber is really what it is. Now, whether it's, the, whether it's the jacket or whether it's the cross tubes, it does, relatively, it does exactly the same thing. When the vapors rise in your column and they get to that point, then they start to pre-condense and they start to drop. Now, as they drop back down, and you should probably have copper in here, or rashing rings, marbles, or some kind of medium for them to drop through. As they start to drop, what they'll do is they'll start to re-vaporize. Now, the most volatile substance scientifically based on the chart, you know, because ethanol is going to vaporize at a different temperature than water, and methanol is going to vaporize a lot quicker than that. But what happens is, is that as they start to drop back down, that volatile substance, ethanol at this point, starts to re-vaporize, and it separates from the water and starts to rise again. Well, as it starts to rise, it's going to drag a little bit of water with it, but it's going to get back to the pre-condensing chamber, and it'll drop again. Now, when it drops and starts to re-vaporize, it's going to drop off that water and then rise again. Now, so you see, this, that's what a reflux is. It's this constant exchange of energy and the dropping off of water molecules and the rising of the most pure vapor, which is the ethanol. That's why a reflux still will always produce a higher proof of spirit as opposed to a pot still. And it's also the reason why a reflux still will strip a lot of the flavor because most of your flavor is attached to those water molecules as opposed to the ethyl alcohol. Kind of makes sense now, doesn't it? Well, what will happen is, is once this balances and this reflux action gets working, so th those uh, volatile vapors will start to rise past your pre-condensing chamber because this is not as cold or doesn't have as much water running through it as your condenser and they'll make their way out to your condenser. Now this is called the Liebig condenser. And 
once it gets into the Liebig condenser, it'll condense back to a liquid and it'll come out as pure alcohol. Now that's it in a nutshell. Now what the difference is, is in a pot still, you don't have this pre-condensing chamber. So what invariably happens is, is that all of that vapor under controlled temperature, because a pot still is a little bit different, you're going to control the your head temperature by the heat that you introduce into it. As opposed to the uh, reflux still where you get it hot and then once you start the balance process you'll actually control the head temperature by the water flow in the jacket or into your cross tubes. There's, it's just a little bit difference in a technique but, but it works and it works extremely well. So just remember in a pot still you're going to control the heat inside your kettle. Uh, to maintain the head temperature. Uh, you're going to control heat no matter what, but you want to make sure that you're controlling the heat for a pot still to control the head temperature. In a reflux still, you're going to heat the kettle to the appropriate temperature, and then you're going to control the head temperature via the amount of water flow, which is going to be volume in the, uh, in the jacket or in the cross tubes. So, but what happens in the pot still is that as those vapors start to rise under that controlled heat, they grab that flavor, they grab some water molecules, and they rise up the column. They don't pre-condense, so they run directly through the Liebig condenser. They condense and they come out the other end. Now, that's why they're a little bit lower in proof, because they're dragging a lot of that water and that addi those additional chemicals with them to include some flavor. Um, now, once they come out, now those will come out on sort of like a rule of thumb is anywhere between 130 to 145-ish or so for a pot still. Um, in a reflux still, you can get as high as 190 proof. And some people, depending on your technique and process, can go a little bit higher. And that's quite all right. But just remember, at the end of the day, uh, and we've got a board out here, so you know we're going to do some writing on it. At the end of the day, <laughs> if you've only got a 15% alcohol by volume in this kettle, you're not going to draw out any more than 15% of that volume. Let me give you a real quick example. If we have a three gallon, let's say we had a five gallon, a five gallon still, eight gallon still, we put five gallons in it. And in that five gallons, there we go, in that five gallons, we have 20% ABV, which is very, very high. Uh, I, I'd recommend anywhere between 14 to 16 or so. It's a lot more manageable and it's also a lot less cumbersome. So, but 20% ABV in a five gallon mash is equal to one gallon, one gallon of ethanol or the, or the alcohol that you want to draw out. Now, of course, there are other components in there, so it's going to make that, and I'm looking for that thing to, to wipe it off with. Uh, there are other things in there that's going to make it not desirable. So this one gallon is going to be a ballpark figure. So you've got that ballpark figure. Now, let's say, for instance, here it is. Let's say, for instance, we have 10% alcohol by volume in that mash. And we measure that, remember, we measure that using a hydrometer. Uh, we get the beginning gravity and final gravity, then we do the math, uh, or you roll the th uh, hydrometer around and find out what your potential alcohol percentage is. And that'll give you a bulb, that'll give you a data point. So let's say we have 10% alcohol by volume. The most that we could possibly, <coughs> and that's if we remove everything that's there, and that's the heads, the hearts, the tails, all, if we removed everything, we're only going to get a half a gallon. So remember, your alcohol by volume is a direct function of how much in volume you can remove. You can't get three quarters of a gallon if you've only got a 10% ABV. It's just not there. So it doesn't make alcohol. It's, you're separating. You're separating alcohol from the water and some of the other byproducts. All right, now here's another interesting factoid for you. Uh, just keep this in mind because I'm more inclined, uh, when I get froggy, I'm more inclined to run a pot still as opposed to a reflux still. And here's the reason why. Um, we all know that in a reflux still, we're going to drag out a lot of that flavor. 
Uh, it's some of that flavor we want. Uh, and in a pot still, we retain most of that flavor. It, in a lot of cases, that's what we want. So, but if we're gonna make a gin, we're gonna make a vodka, we're gonna make a neutral spirit, a reflux still is wonderful for that. Uh, but if you're gonna make a bourbon, a whiskey, uh, some kind of, you're better off with a pot still. But it's always nice to have the option. Um, and for the sake of the cost, these are like 315 bucks, uh, but for the sake of the cost, and in most cases, the difference between a pot still and a reflux still is that one adaptation so you're only looking at a couple of dollars difference between the two. It's better to have the option later to go to a reflux because once you get a pot still, you can't turn it into a reflux uh, unless you got a welder and you kind of know what you're doing. So it's, a, it's better to have that because you, you don't have to hook this up. You can just leave it alone and run it as a pot still. But here's what I offer you. Let's say, for instance, we do have that half a gallon. Okay, if we take that half a gallon and it comes out in a pot still at 130 to 140 proof. If we took that same half gallon and ran it through a reflux still, and we ran that reflux still, and it comes out at 190 proof. Now, here's where science comes in on your side. But I guess it all depends on which side you're really on. But if you're on my side in this particular case, because I've had this discussion, not argument, this discussion, is that at this point, a half a gallon, I'm going to probably wind up with, I'll, I'll, I'll wind up it easily with five quarts of spirits that is brought down to about 80 proof, 80 to 85 proof. That's what my result is going to be. Well, if you take that 190, you'll collect a little bit less than a half a gallon because remember now you're collecting the pure alcohol and you're leaving everything else behind and in this case you're going to collect a lot more of everything else too but when you cut this down to 80 to 85 proof you're going to wind up with just about five quarts so you're going to wind up with the same thing in the end but so you've got you've got the bragging rights. Your cool points go way up when you go, hey, that's 190 proof. And that's good if you're going to make a neutral spirit. Uh, but your cool points aren't really that high if you're trying to make a whiskey or a rye whiskey or a bourbon. If you're trying to do something like that, your cool points are starting to drop because you're at 190 proof and you're stripping a lot of that flavor out. Now, let's talk one last topic about flavor so that we're not. So you understand this. This just kind of makes logical sense um, just because you draw you're drawn off at a higher proof doesn't necessarily mean you're getting more of, matter of fact it doesn't mean that you're getting more of it you're just getting a pure ver variety or version of it and you're gonna wind up with the same thing okay I get this question all the time too is well George what if I take apples and I crush them up and I prepare them and I heat them and I get them all separated and everything and, and then I ferment those and then I take that and I put that into my still and when I distill it as a pot still, is it going to come out? It's going to come, well they'll tell me, I'm trying to make an apple jack, it's going to come out tasting like apples. Um, that's not necessarily true and unfortunately you'll be very disappointed um, if you have that thought process. Uh, keep in mind that what you're going to drag through in a pot still, primarily, th there'll be some flavor that you can be able to identify. But primarily what you're going to drag through that is you're going to drag through the flavor character. Let me give you an example. If you were to take one still and run apples through it uh, at, that you had fermented and your distillate comes off, that distillate's going to have an apple character to it. It may even have a slight apple aroma and it may, you may even be able to notice um, some apple flavor, very a small, a slight hint. <laughs> but what the challenge is going to be is that you'll be disappointed because you, your expectation is a crisp apple, but it's not going to be a crisp apple, but it's going to have that character. Now, if you took that and you infused some an apple extract, that apple character liquid is going to take on that apple and it's going to magnify it. So you get a much more, you'll get a higher yield, and you'll also have a very strong 
apple flavor. So the, the, you understand what I'm saying is that if you've already got the apple character and you add apple to it, which is normally what happens, uh, then you'll have a very good apple distillate. Uh, now, if you took a regular sugar shine, sugar wash, which has absolutely no flavor, or you ran the apples as a reflux and brought them out of the 190, then cut them down and then added the apple flavor. You'll still have an apple flavor, but you'll notice the difference because there's the lack of the apple character in the base product. Now, I hope I haven't, I hope I haven't confused anyone, but it's just to let you know that Yes, whatever you distill, you're going to carry the character and flavor over, but don't be confused and think that a blueberry wash is going to taste like a mouthful of blueberries, because they're not. Uh, they'll be close, but they're not going to taste like a mouthful of blueberries. All right, <laughs> now we've gone through this one, and that makes that so simple. I'll move this out of the way, and let's introduce you to a new one, a new product we're carrying, and this is the traditional pot still. And in a traditional pot still, you're going to notice immediately <coughs> the length of your Liebig condenser is extremely long. Oh, this goes on so easy. Just make sure you don't over tighten any of these connections. Um, the Liebig condenser is extremely long, and you'll also notice the lack of a column because this is a traditional pot still. So there's no need for a column in this particular design. There we go, I just, you just gotta get this thing good and finger tight. So this is the column. The column portion just curves. And you'll also notice that there's no thermometer anywhere. There's no temperature gauge to find out what the temperature is. You'll run this still. This is for someone who's a little bit more experienced in running a pot still, um, where they don't use a thermometer at the head temperature. Now what I've actually done is I've run this and just to make sure that I'm on track I'll use one of those oven thermometers you know with a thermal couple and the probe uh, the heat probe whatever you want to call it and what I did was uh, I just took a couple of zip ties and I zip tied it to the side of the column oops to the, to the top of the column here and I just put two zip ties just to measure the temperature of this. And the reason I did that was because I wanted to know when I could go relieve myself or if I could answer the phone because you know that once it gets to about 120 here, it's gonna spike from 120 to 180 or so. Uh, and that way you're there close enough to control it. Now remember, this is the pot still. Then how do we control the flow on the pot still is by the heat, how much heat you're adding to it. Now whether that be propane, whether that be the stove, or whether that be on a heater element, <coughs> you're going to control that. You'll control the flow, and that's why it's used by someone who's a little bit more experienced normally. Um, a beginners can do this. A novice can do this without any, any problem at all. But remember, cold water goes in the bottom. It comes with hoses. Cold water goes in the bottom, and then your discharge is from the top. And you can do this the same way that we do ours when we run them routinely is with a water pump. And the water pump is there in a bucket of ice just to make the water last longer. But we just circulate that water until it starts to get warm and the ice starts to melt. And then we just reintroduce some more ice to it. Uh, that just makes it last that much longer. So, but you've got a couple of options with this as well. Um, this will run, and remember we described the proper technique or the proper way that a still should run, you know, with the spurt, drip, 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 spurt. Uh, you can go back on some of the other videos and you can review that. But that's how we're going to run this. And we're going to run this by sight and what it produces um, and how, it, how, how the still actually acts as opposed to tracking a temperature. One of the options you have, and this comes with a plug that goes into a small half inch hole. You can boost your cool points with the addition of a dial thermometer on the side of, uh, on the, side of the kettle, which will tell you what the temperature of the kettle is. <laughs> but, uh, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this now. For a still, the this, this, this style of still, of a traditional pot still, a thermometer on the side of the kettle is probably more advantageous than not. Um, and that is because it's probably the only place you can be able to track the temperature of the mash. 
uh, and that would help you engaging what your output should be because you'll be adjusting the heat up and down. Remember, we run the pot still by adjusting the heat. We run a reflux still by adjusting the water flow. So in this particular case, this would be advantageous. Now, if this was a reflux still, I would tell you that this has nothing to do with what's going on in a column. And the reason I say that, here's an analogy for you. If you jumped in the car and you took off down the road, now can remember in a, in a reflux still, we're, we're tracking the head temperature, not the kettle temperature. But okay, you're driving down the road and I say, I want you to drive 50 miles an hour. Here's my question. Would you look at the tachometer or would you look at the speedometer? Well, you would look at the speedometer because the speedometer will tell you exactly how fast you're going. The tachometer is going to tell you how fast the engine is running that may or may not correlate in every case to 50 miles an hour being like 3000 RPMs is equivalent to 50 miles. It depends on what gear you're in. Depends. A lot of things are dependent. Well, if you think about a still the same way, this would be a tachometer. Your head temperature is your speedometer. So you want to bring your still up to 168 degrees, 169 degrees and hold it for 10 minutes. You would track the head temperature on a reflux still or on a column pot still. You wouldn't track the kettle temperature, which would be your tachometer. It's just telling you kind of what's going on in here. But in any event, even with a reflux still, if you've got a dial thermometer, it's another one of them cases where your cool points go way up. You can demonstrate how warm it is in here, or how hot it is in here, as opposed to how hot it is in the head temperature. So that's kind of makes sense. Now, these are adaptable. You, you, you also roll up copper mesh, and I put two rolls of copper in always. That's you know equivalent to two plates. And just slide them up in the column, and they slide right back out real easy. As long as you don't pack them in there real tight. Just be careful, don't pack them in there real tight. But there is no place for rashing rings, marbles, or anything else that you want to put in there. Just put some copper in there, and it runs extremely well. We ran a, uh, we ran a honey wash, and this eight gallon model took us, we used a 2,000 watt heater element with a controller, and it took us about, oh, pretty close to about three hours to, uh, to run our, uh, our honey shine. Uh, as opposed to the Mighty Mini, because we only filled that up with just about three gallons, and that one ran for just, just shy of three hours, about two and a half hours. Uh, three hours total for heat up and then production and shutdown. Uh, this one would run you about a good, give yourself a good five hours from start to finish, and that is turning it on and heating it up, uh, and that'll run. All right. Uh, hey, look, that's what I've got to offer you right now. There are some options. Now, in, in the next video when we open up, we're going to talk about options for heating a still, uh, and then we're going to delve into some electro. Yeah, you get tongue tied. We're going to delve into some electricity and we're going to talk about selection of the proper heating element or the proper heater uh, in, in some sort. Uh, also, how to select those, um, how to do the real quick math to figure out what, what watts do I need, what volts should I be running on, how to wire it up whether it's 120 or 2, 240, um, oh, how to test them. We're going to cover a lot of different topics, but we'll be back with you shortly. So. Happy distilling.